Welcome to Talk Time with Max Contact. I'm your host, Sean McIver, and today my guest is Chris Rainsworth. As an award-winning customer contact specialist and the director of The Forum, Chris brings a wealth of experience from his operational management background at Verint and EG Solutions. He's known for developing impactful training programs with initiatives, delivering engaging workshops, and speaking at major conferences. With Chris's diverse experience spanning various functions and industries, I'm really looking forward to getting insights and inspiration that will benefit everyone listening. Let's not hang about because we've got a lot to get through. First off, hi Chris, welcome. Did I miss anything in your introduction? No, I think you, I think you, you, you nailed it. I think the only thing um, I ever had is I started working in contact centers in 1995 uh, when I first when I first kind of dipped my toe into that and. You know, it's it's been that just that longevity of a career that I just I, I love it. I just love it. I love everything about it. And I, you know, it's hopefully some of that passion will come across today, Sean. Excellent. I'm very similar position myself. I started off on the phones. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was it was maybe about 10, 15 years ago. And it was one of those things where I was like, I need a job. I'll go and work in a call center. It'll just be for a couple of months until I get something else. And then lo and behold, here I am over a decade later. And it's like, <laughs> actually, no, there's a reason that I do this. There's a reason I'm good at this. Exactly. So let me start off. Um, obviously, thank you very much for joining us today. Can you tell me a little bit more about your role? So at the forum, what you what you actually do on the day to day? Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so so the forum's an organisation. We've been around now for this is our twenty fourth year, twenty third year, coming in, in the year twenty four. Um, and we set up originally. We, the idea was that we want to professionalise the contact centre industry. That was the ethos that sat behind it. And through that, giving organisations access to best practice creating learning, creating um, tools and, and methodologies that people can apply within their day-to-day -day business to hopefully raise standards and hopefully engage people in a different way. So my role today is to try to consolidate that within the organisation. So, you know, we spend, my day is spent researching, looking at things, speaking to our members and our customers, understand the challenges that they've got organisationally, to understand if there's anything we can do as an organization to support them and give them something that will help their thinking, help shape their development plans, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, we you know, we fundamentally my role is to hopefully make people better at their roles. And I think that that's something that a lot of people will resonate with. Um, and I'm going to touch on this in a little while specifically. But I want to just kind of step back for just a moment and just interrogate your your the the origin point of the forum, if I can. Generally, when trying hard not to anchor this, but generally when when a new um, when a new initiative is set up, it's because what's there already is either ineffective or it's falling short. Would you say that was the equivalent in the space of learning through the lens of what you now do? What was missing and, and how has that changed in the intervening years? Yeah, 100%. So our founder, Paul, he was a planner, a planner at heart. He, 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 he liked, we, we always say, whatever you're doing, everything's a plan. So regardless, in the contact centre world, that then gets a bit kind of pigeonholed into resource planning. We try to broaden that and go, actually, if you're planning, you're planning. And, 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 and there's, there's lots of facets of that that you need to take into account. And back when the forum started, it was originally called the Professional Planning Forum. So the idea being to professionalise people that were looking at forecasting, scheduling, real-time management, all those things. And we want to develop frameworks and, and training to really enhance people within those roles. Because for all that, in the infancy of the contact centre, there's a lot of focus on the front line, which is perfectly acceptable and we need to support the front line and the operational teams that are, that are delivering that service. What we found was there's a gap in the industry to look after and support the people that work in some of those more supportive functions within the contact centre. So resource planning is where we where we kind of cut our teeth and developed. We then started to move into things like MI and insight and analytical type roles, and then into things like quality assurance, customer experience. And 
and, and then over the years, we now provide learning for, for every part of the contact centre, whether you're a frontline advisor or, you know, an MI analyst. We've, we've got material, we've got learning, we've got best practice, we've got events and networking and various other things that support you in your role. Uh, and what we're hopeful of is those kind of different siloed functions start to work smarter together to actually deliver a broader kind of deliverable in terms of the service, the support, the the confidence that they have as an organisation rather than kind of yeah, keeping really narrow-minded in what they're doing. It's interesting that you've raised a point that I was going to touch on, so I'm going to bring it forward a little bit now. Um, the, the, the forum specialise in supporting those roles that are often seen as, and I'm going to directly quote a previous director I worked under, quote, non-revenue generating entities, end quote. And I remember that always stuck with me. I was like, that's a terrible way to define someone's role. And it, I feel that often supportive roles in a contact center, quality, et cetera, are often forgotten about and kind of deprioritized. Um, and that's always been my, not always, but that's a number of times been my interpretation of what I've seen through my roles in my career. And it's interesting that you've just basically reflected that. So it says to me that this is something that's not novel or unique to some of those places no. I've worked. I suppose for those businesses out there, how does a business go about addressing that shortfall that, that we are both intimately familiar with? There's, there's, a two, there's two things, really. I, and I was look at one of going, you need to understand the, 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 the support functions are uh, the glue that holds the contact centre together, predominantly for my mind. And what we try to do is get people to get to the right conversation with the right people, have that seat at the table that allows them to influence contact centre decision making within their organisation. And that we do that, I think we do that by giving them a spotlight, giving them, giving them the, the spotlight, giving them the, the confidence that they can go have the right conversations, that they can be reflective and understand where they add value and then being able to articulate the value they add back into their stakeholders so they don't get forgotten about. To, to your point, you know, a lot of these things are disregarded when budgets are looked at, when um, times get busy, whatever it might be. We start to look, and we, what we try to do is go actually, you need to be on parity with the front line, the parity. You know, they are delivering a service and we get that, but they need to be supported because as soon as you strip that support away, the knock-on effect of that is that the guys that you want to deliver the great service don't have the support to be able to deliver that service. So keeping the investment going in one direction, you will ultimately end up causing yourself a bigger issue down the line in terms of what you try to deliver for your customer. Yes, um, I, I would agree with you on that one. Um, I'm, there's another kind of lens to look at this through, which I want to raise as well. And that's the what I, I, another thing that I've seen kind of in tandem with that trend. Is that there's another trend and it happens on two fronts. Um, and one is the first is that as, as you move through the hierarchy of a business, I've seen cultures or businesses where the learning seems to tail off as you ascend the career ladder. I guess as a director yourself, how do you encourage your team members to embrace a culture of learning? And how do you really embed that learning culture and facilitate it? It's really, it's really simple to say, hard to execute, right? But it's simple to say, we, we work on the premise and we try to speak with organisations, but we use this phrase around giving people the permission to learn. Right? So I think people like being told what to do, but they also, a lot of people like to be inquisitive and go away and learn on their own. So we try and make learning easy. So we go, look, we can make learning as easy as you want, but you've got to take the responsibility for your learning. That, that's that's the kind of contract or the you know the the, the, the non-written contract is we'll make it really easy for you we'll give you the time we'll give you the content we'll give you the material we'll give you what you need you've got to go in and do that i think you're right as you as you move through your career 
I think the mandated learning, what we try to get people to think about is the bottom level of any organisation is the mandated stuff, the stuff you need to learn to do your job. Where we want to try and take people is up that ladder to go, I want to be really inquisitive and I want to explore and I want to learn things. Now, when we work with good organisations that have built in a learning, you know, a, a learning culture at their organisation, it's embedded throughout so that, you know, it could be that everyone's given a specific amount of time every week, every month, whatever it is, that's for them to focus on their learning. They can do with it what they want. That's their time to go away and better themselves. Now, outside of the mandate, learning stuff, they might want to go away and read an article, get up to date on industry trends, whatever it might be. And I think if we take that mindset through our career, then we're always wanting to understand and we always want to learn and we always want to learn, you know, get better at what we do i always say to people that as soon as you think you know everything you're, you're very weakest in terms of being a professional so i think at that point you become really close-minded to other thoughts other ideas other ways of doing things and i think if we just keep pushing that and giving people access if we continue to give people access to best practice we give people access to a community of people that are sharing and showing what they've done, the mistakes they've made, the gains they've made, whatever those things are. If we continue to do that, we get better as an industry. But the first step is with the individual. They've got to own their own learning. And if they don't own their own learning, they'll never push forward. And I think that's a really important point as well. I've always felt that both personal development plans and learning are both exactly that. They're personal. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that one of my one of the people in my family has always said is, is if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Okay. And I, I've always that's resonated with me all the time. And I think it speaks to that intrinsic desire to progress, to learn, to improve. Obviously, not everybody's the same. So I just want to reflect that back a little bit. So where do you feel the responsibility lies in terms of the, the learning and the ownership therein through the lens of what often happens or what I've seen a number of times, several, many times, is that a business will promote a member of staff into a role and then go, off you go, you're a manager now. And, and it's kind of a, huh? there's a bit of a rabbit in headlights. So there's an element of, I need to own my own learning, but there's also a degree of the business needs to own that there's a, there's a responsibility on them to deliver appropriate learning for the manager. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think the, the challenge we have, or the issue we have, I think, as an industry, I think this happens quite a bit in different organisations, especially through our promotion or, or that kind of um, people moving on and, or up in roles within, within the, the business that they're working. We forget that they're still learning, so it's that idea of going, if we're going to promote someone, what support's in place? And sometimes we, we we don't have a support structure that is tailored for each of the roles that sit within that organisation. So we might invest heavily on the frontline advisor, for example, to make sure they're delivering the service, that they're doing that. We provide them with coaching. We'll, we'll do their quality assurance. There'll be L&D pathways that they're, that they're linked to. And then it starts to, to your point, it falls away a bit the further up the ladder you go. And fundamentally, we then are asking people to do a role that they're not familiar with. They might be good at certain elements of it, but they will have gaps. Everyone will have a gap. No matter what role you're in now, no one knows everything can do anything. And I think if an organisation is going to promote within and they are going to bring people into those roles, there has to be a development pathway for them to help enhance their skills on the flip side to say look this is what we've got this is what's available to you what else do you need and it's that you know it, but having strong leadership in those roles that are mentoring those people is where it all comes together because if you don't have that strong mentor men, you know that strong mentor who's you, you, you're reporting into if they don't give you the the tools the the, the opportunity to go away and develop it will fall away so it just it really has to be joined up all the way through and there is significant you know development pathways for people regardless of the role that they're that they're going into 
I think that's a really important point when you touch on mentors is that there's there's absolutely a responsibility on the individual to own their own learning path. But I think that and we, when we talked about carving time out for yourself to make sure that you've got dedicated learning time. But I think it's also fair to say that that responsibility comes from the mentor as well. If the mentor so again, using previous you know, lived experience, you know, there's someone who is unable to get through the workload and therefore they employ someone into a position to support the person to get through all of the workload. All of a sudden, you've now got a department. However, within that department, there's there's still too, you know, a huge amount of work. And one of the things I've always found is that when you first bring someone in, actually, there's a reduction in productivity because yeah. the person has to take time out to teach this new person. Yeah. It's not, again, it's not the sudden you've been, you've got a new team member, off you go. Um, and I think it's important, and it's not even a question, it's just to point out that imperative of the mentor has to have time and the mentee has to have time to learn as well. Go back to my original point, everything's about planning, right? So you go back to that. So as you do the development path, it's about planning for that. We're going to promote six new team leaders, right? Those six new team leaders aren't going to be 100% productive on the ball. They're going to have to develop their coaching skills. They're going to have to understand whatever paperwork and processes that they're going to have to deal with in, in terms of managing their team, whatever it might be. So we have to have that, that, that visibility to say, look, this is where we... We do it with recruitment. We do it when we go through a recruitment process for advisors into the contact centre. We, you know, most planning teams will go right. We'll recruit twelve heads at this point, and then they're not fully effective for six months. So actually, that's the point where we should start seeing improvement in our KPIs or our deliverables, whatever it might be. We don't take that same process or same principle sometimes when we go up. And actually, the same principle applies when we put people in role, there's an adjustment period. And that adjustment period, underpinned by support from their mentor, their leader, whatever it is, needs to be planned in and then up again another level. So if you're looking after these six new team leaders as an operations manager, for example, what's that impact on my time? And what do I, what responsibility do I need, um, kind of, you know, disseminate out throughout the broader team so I can support these people. All that stuff needs planning. Um, and if we plan around it, we can support it and we can deliver what we need to deliver. But it is it all comes back to planning. Agreed. Uh, very much agreed. I'm going to I'm going to kind of unpack a little further on what you just mentioned before with your example of six new team leaders, six new managers, six new staff members who have either been brought in or promoted into the role. There are different modalities when it comes to learning and the psychology of learning, visual, audio, kinesthetic, et cetera, et cetera. And within a contact center, we've talked about that ramp up, you know, of six months or whatever. What I've seen and heard um, and experienced is that that seems to be, whether it's driven by this kind of increase in churn or challenges with retaining staff, that seems to be there's a there's a downward push from above to bring that down as short as possible uh, and a push from below to kind of ensure that people are filled into those roles. How can we deliver effective training under those increasingly tight ramp up periods with those expectations? It, it, it's really difficult. And, and, and you know, you, you're saying the industry is struggling to recruit. It, it really is. Um, you know, we speak to organisations all the time that are, you know, 20 percent behind headcount or 50 percent behind headcount in, 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 in some example in what they need to deliver. But the organisations that are doing it well kind of accept that. So, for example, you know, we'll speak with an organisation and go, OK, so what's your plan? What are you looking to do? What, what are you trying to deliver? Now, we offer a range of different learning. We do on-demand video. We've got pathways where they're supported by a mentor or a coach. Rather, there's, there's various different things, all supported by different techniques. So if people want exercises, they can download exercises and do the exercise. If people don't want, just want to watch a video, they can just watch a video. We try to balance what we do, and we try to speak to organisations when they're going through that process to try and provide balance, but focus on the key elements that are going to make it really valuable for the individual. So onboard them correctly, make sure they understand the role, make sure they understand the organisation, make sure they understand the 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 impact they have, you know, in, in terms of the individual. 
we're finding more and more that people are trying to support this through technology, which is fine. So utilizing things like a knowledge management system or whatever it might be to, to build up a level of product knowledge that doesn't need that massive investment of, of, of kind of time. Like we used to, and I mean, when I first started, you'd have a week on learning how to do a process and the next week could be another process and the next kind of, we can't do, we haven't got the luxury of being able to do that. And actually, as we become more self-serve, service oriented, when we become more self-aware in terms of how we deal with customers, we don't need to invest that time. What we can do is make sure we are bringing people through that understand the business, understand the culture, understand their part, the part they play in delivering what they need to deliver and giving them things that allow them to do that. The tools, the technology, whatever it is, show them how to use that technology, but teach them how to be collaborative, teach them how to communicate effectively, teach them how to these are things that will add value. The processes, the knowledge, the systems, you know, they they can be taught as a, as a, a kind of a separate entity at a more kind of sped up pace. Focus has to be on them and their behavior and their kind of how they deliver what they need to deliver. There's, there's two branching questions that then come off the back of that. And the first one is one I haven't planned. So apologies, I'm going to kind of catch <laughs> you off guard here. But you mentioned communication there. Uh, and in the same breath, you talked about that being something that can be trained. I just want to kind of understand a bit more about that, because for me, looking again at kind of the the modalities and the very broadly speaking, the styles of people uh, as individuals, there are some people who are naturally very, very good at communication. And there are some people who are naturally exceptional in other areas. Yeah. Is it genuinely I don't mean this to sound in the wrong way, but is it is it genuinely fair to say that communication is a skill that can be trained in that sense? It's it's a skill that you can become really aware of, right? So I I think from a communication perspective, it's a skill. You're right. Some people are natural communicators, you know, but we're in a multi-channel world now when it comes to contact center and actually if you can understand the principles of good communication when you're speaking to a customer or interacting with a customer through whatever medium it is and you know making sure you, 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 you you're having you're being clear and you've got the clarity and you're getting the point across in the right way you're delivering kind of you know that concise uh language those little bits of understanding can be developed and enhanced. Your natural style will always be your natural style. But if you understand, you know, how you've got to get to the point, making sure you're delivering what you say you're going to deliver, being concise, being clear, all those things I think can be taught, not in the traditional sense, but, in, you know, embedded in a, your mindset that you're aware of those things when you're communicating, both with customers and both with, you know, your, your colleagues as well. No, that's 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 a really interesting point. Um, and it's again, it's one that I hadn't planned on asking, but when you mentioned it, it was one that I thought like I, I really wanted to interrogate that. The other side of it is something that you touched on, which was around knowledge management systems, learning management systems, whatever the appropriate acronym insert here is. And I suppose you, you also talked around the technology and the tools. Um, and I, I can't get through a single episode of this series at the moment without asking the obvious question. And that's around artificial intelligence, chat GPT, the future of the contact center is doomed. You know, what's your what's your thoughts on in terms of making the best use of the tools available? I think, you know, I, I, I'm i I'm one of the people that sit on the fence a bit when it comes to AI, not in that I don't think it will add massive value to us as an organisation or as an industry going forward. I think it's all, already doing some great, great work and, 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 and supporting a lot of good initiatives with different technology providers starting to enhance what they can offer and then similarly how that then will support an agent or a team leader or a coach or whatever going forward. I think for me, what it will look like in 10 years' time, I don't think nobody knows, really don't. And I, I think anybody that says they do is lying. I just, I just don't think, because it's moving at such a pace that there's no way you can be confident that in 10 years' time we're going to be in a situation. You, you can't even be confident 12 months from now how different it's going to be because it's just accelerating quicker than any other technology that we've ever had within our industry, right, without a doubt. 
So I think that there is some great examples of people utilising it in a way that's going to enhance what we do. You know, we've stripped a lot of stuff out when it comes to contact centre through self-serve. Got to load that. AI will enhance that self-serve capability for a lot of organisations. We're seeing examples now of, of, of kind of quality assurance providers using it to, to kind of help uh, tailor feedback or for the for the evaluation process and knowledge management systems helping it to do kind of in real time knowledge for people and bringing, you know, all these things will just enhance what we do. It'll make an advisor's job more difficult going forward, I think. I think it'll make, you know, for all that, it's going to help us. It'll make us more difficult because we're going to have to be more um, tuned in to the, the fallout of AI as opposed to letting AI guide what we do. So there'll be certain things where it goes, we just can't do that for whatever it is. That human element, that human level of thinking is not there yet. So we're going to have to be where, you know, as, as, as agents dealing with customers and the fallout from the AI, that's where we're going to really have to invest in our people to make sure they've got that skill set to be able to be, you know, that kind of super agent, for want of a better phrase, that can deal with a lot of, a lot of complexity. And that's that's a trend that's been coming through since I started doing these these shows. Um, it's been around this migration from the the end user who's answering calls and interacting with customers, moving from kind of almost what was perceived to be a very simplistic role whereby they're either processing payments or handling predominantly basic inquiries with the introduction of self-service and now these additional tools. Actually, when a call or an interaction finally does get through to one of these users, after going through that process, actually, the skill level required at that point is much, much greater. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting that you touch on that there. The So I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit now. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the forum. Um, there are four key communities within the forum. You've got professional planning forum, quality and customer excellence, data analytics and insight forum, and customer strategy and leadership forum. Now, even just looking at those four titles, in my mind, and forgive me if I'm being kind of unfair, but in my mind, I've got a vision of what styles these people may have. Tell me about those, how they differ in their learning styles, and how does that translate to the industry in your experience? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It's interesting you say. So, you know, if we, if we go, I kind of start with customer strategy and leadership, right? Because, you know, those are those leaders heads of the the directors what you know in those those roles that are driving that strategic direction of so their style is very much aligned to they want to learn stuff but they want to be kind of shown what good looks like they want to be they want to understand what's available to them so we we do a lot of stuff around emerging technology in those types of discussions with, with the strategy leadership team because they're, you know, they're the ones that are kind of trying to walk it. So where do we look going forward? Where do we invest? What do we need to do? And then as you go down into the, the the kind of practitioner level, so I call it practitioner level, it's probably not the best word to use, but, you know, we will speak to the resource planners within an organisation. We'll speak to those MI analysts, all very different in their approach, very data-led. Um, they like numbers, they, they like, you know, that they like to be given stuff to do. They like problems to solve. So you give them examples, you give them problems, you let them go away and, and, and solve them and say, look, use these two. You know, if you move across in a quality customer experience, that's all about, fundamentally, that's took a bit of a shift over the last few years, as you can imagine. So when we first started that, that discussion, it was all very much around the assessment process that people have deployed within their, uh, within their contacts. And it's always our assessment form, what's our criteria with that? You know, we talk around calibration and we talk around sample sizing and, all those things, but over the course of the last couple of years, that's it's grown arms and legs where it's now going, okay, so actually it's part of a broader improvement cycle that allows us to think, okay, so quality assurance is like a dip check of kind of how our people are performing. We'll have customer feedback, we'll have L&D teams, we'll have these little knowledge management teams. We'll have, so actually this improvement framework becomes a little bit broader than just quality assurance, just customer experience. It's more of a flip now going, okay, how do we support the employee? How do we make sure we're giving them what they need? 
and that in turn will improve our quality, will improve our customer experience, will in turn do that. So we're starting to see a bit of a shift. Resource planning being more holistic now. So we've had to take that, that you know, that all, the traditional kind of planning cycle. We forecast something, we then schedule our people against that forecast, and then we manage in real time. Now, that still happens by and large in a lot of organisations. But what we're trying to get people to think about now is the flip side of that. I'm going, OK, so when you're forecasting, what does that look like? What does it feel like? And then we've started across all the forums now is this application of what we term as playbooks. So based on the real time situation, what do you do? So not just about, you know, we've planned for this and this has happened. We're going, you've planned. This is the real time situation. What are we doing about it? What play, what what situation, how does that reflect, whether that's a recruitment decision, whether it's a staffing decision, whether it's a customer service, it doesn't matter. But having all these different areas to go, how do you, what's the playbook for that? What is the operational playbook for us in this certain situation? Rather than us firefighting all the time, we're trying to get people to think about it a bit more because we know it's volatile. We know things are uncertain. We know these things now. So let's be prepared for that and be prepared for the actual situation, not just kind of go back and go, we forecast it was going to be a bad week. And you go, oh, well done, that you forecast it was going to be a bad week. What have we done to try and make it a better week? It, it's so, so we try to push that decision-making differently now. If I can just kind of ask a quick question off the back of that, I know we're still not through all of these, but I just wanted to ask a very quick question off the back of that. You talked there about firefighting and playbooks. Those to me sound like they should feed into each other. So you 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 go through a firefighting period, and at the end of that, you do presumably a lessons learned of some kind. But that should then feed into a playbook, presumably, which is here's what you do the next time that happens. And then when it does happen, you pick up your playbook and you go, right, we've had this before. This is how we do better than last time. Hundred percent. So we 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 term it as the known knowns and the unknown unknowns you've probably seen the famous you know the famous speech by rumsfeld uh, all those years ago but we, we we use that terminology now with a lot of our customers and and, and our clients that are talking around that going okay so now you know that's what happens now you know the impact you know what adjustment you need to make there'll always be some unknowns that you don't know right that these new things that happen you know we used to use you know the queen's death as an example of a a, a kind of unknown known right you kind of know it's going to happen at some point but you don't know when so you knew that was going to impact us we knew we were going to get a, you know a day off we knew these you know we knew these things would happen we just didn't know when it was going to happen so how do you pivot really quickly to that situation covid was another one right so these are things are going we probably no one planned for that right even on the back of things like bird flu pandemics and things like that we didn't really think it was ever good so no one really planned for it but now you kind of go right okay so we've shown that we can you know, get people working effectively in a really dire situation. We pivoted really quickly. We, we got rid of a lot of red tape from stuff in terms of procurement and all that. So we, we prove out that we can do a lot of these things. So now that just sits in your playbook. And if those situations happen again, you go, right, I know what we need to do. We need to increase staffing. We need to do that. We need to do this. So, yeah, it's all about learning and then making sure you you you, you kind of have that then as a, as your kind of plan should that situation arise again in the future that makes sense awesome i like that i really like that um i'm going to close out with one last question to kind of close the full circle of our full conversation as best as i can um we started off talking about planning is everything then we talked around where the forum came from the kind of origin point of the forum um and that learning wasn't where it needed to be for many individuals out there and what was missing and what's changed. Obviously, in the intervening years, a lot has changed, and we're now in a different world for a whole host of reasons, some planned, some unplanned. <laughs> With your planning hat on, what does the future look like then? It's a difficult one to answer, Sean. You, you, you've got it, you know, it is, it's one of them. Right? If, if I knew the answer, I'd be a millionaire, right, and I'd be sitting on a beach somewhere. I think that, that's the key point. I think what, what is, for me, what is really apparent at the minute is that the contact centre is going nowhere. Whatever guys it looks like in five, ten years' time, it's going nowhere. Right? I think the I think what will happen with AI will be it'll go like this and then it'll naturally plateau out at a point where people can accept it 
I think there's we've got to accept it as society, not just as an industry. From a societal point of view, we've got to, we've got to accept it. There's too many people out there that don't understand it fully. I'll, I'll, and I'll put my hand up so, as being one of those people. And I imagine a lot of people listening to this don't fully understand it. So it's really difficult for something to stick when we don't fully understand it because we'll just keep kind of, I don't understand that, so I'm, I'm going to ignore it. So I'll just worry about it another day. So so that will continue, but I think there will be, it'll, it'll, you know, it's now, I think now we're not, not at the peak, but I think we're close to the peak of it in terms of awareness and people doing things. And you see it now where you, you, we're losing a little bit of, original thought out there within the industry we, 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 we're seeing you know the same kind of commentary being driven by it it's like, okay so we, we kind of see that that'll that'll tail off and then it'll find its natural home within the industry and within society and I, and I think it will be a game changer and I think it'll really enhance a lot of things that we do but yeah I, I don't think we're going anywhere I think it's stronger than ever as an industry I think the the, the key thing for me is that over the last few years I think most organizations with a contact center or kind of operation that deals with customers have proven the value they add to the organization it's not just a cost center anymore it's adding value it's driving their brand forward and that's why i think we're in the the the, the best position we've ever been in from an industry perspective and i think that'll continue for the next few years at least um, and we'll continue to add all the value that we can amazing what a note to end it on um that's been absolutely fantastic i think you know from my point of view we've touched on all of the key points i wanted us to kind of cover so thank you ever so much for that um and yeah i think that's uh, as good a point as uh, as we've got to to draw that to a close chris rainsforth director at the forum thank you ever so much for your time today thank you thank you sean